I can only learn so much sitting at my desk in Whitehall and even on a tour where I get taken to all the nice bits. I want to know what's actually going on and how you really feel. What do you need from me? We would like a full q &A that would allow us to be more efficient, more yeah. effective with, with what we've got. I think we've got a bit of a dirty department. Right. <laughs> It'd be lovely to get a brand new department, so yeah. right. yeah, that would be good. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything you're willing to share with us that you wish we'd done differently? Great question, very important question. I think endless things. The big learning is that the NHS can move fast if it needs to, and I think we should all be very proud of that. That's a positive learning, that, you know, whether it's the Nightingale hospitals building them in nine days, you turned around your emergency department in ten. I'm really impressed by just the expansion of the A&E. Yeah. So that attitude, just yeah. get it done, you know, let's just make it happen, and everybody coming to help is so important. I must say thank you so much for all the support to the NHS and I think what we realize here is that doing something fast and reasonable is better than delayed and perfect. Really the thanks are for you, right? It's been a really, really tough year and difficult year and you know how much the public appreciate you and so on their behalf I want to thank you. And this goes not just to everybody in the room but to everybody who works for the NHS locally because my favourite story in the whole world is Kennedy going to NASA and he met a janitor on the way in and he said to that janitor, thank you for helping put a man on the moon. This is a big team effort and everybody looks after the health of everybody around here and so I want to say on behalf of all the people who we all serve, thank you very much. Good afternoon, um, my name is Nimco Ali and um, thank you for joining us here today on the Sunday with In Conversation with um, Matt Hancock. Um, I'll be asking uh, Matt Hancock some questions and then you'll be able to um, send some through. Um, Matt, thank you um, for asking me to um, host this event. I think one of the key questions that people might ask is like, how did I come to this seat? Like, you know, how do you and I know each other and how do I get to um, in interview the health secretary? Well, it's great to be here, Nimco, and I remember a couple of years ago when I first became Health Secretary and you approached me and said, if you think that we should be governing for everybody in this country, then we have to govern uh, for all and provide the NHS for all. And in particular, there is no service to support people and support women who've suffered from FGM and survived FGM, and we need to do that. And we now, thanks to your campaigning, we have eight FGM clinics open around the country. We opened the last ones of them during the pandemic. And in a way, it underlines the point that the NHS is there for us all. Yeah. And it needs to have the services for everybody. And it's under a Conservative government that we have ensured that the NHS has got the resources that it needs and also is, is reflecting modern Britain. I think, um, so uh, that was completely amazing. I think one of the, the speech that you gave um, at the opening of those NHS um, clinics around FGM was one of the most passionate ones that I heard. And what really um, stood with me was the fact that you said, I can't wait for these clinics to be closed down because there was a massive commitment from you and the government in order to end FGM, which I'm greatly thankful for. So the NHS um, saved my life at the age of 11 when I had severe complications from FGM. And it saved my mum's life when she had breast cancer. And it's a service that my niece was born into. What does the NHS mean to you, not just as health secretary, but also as somebody that accesses it? Well, yeah, this is, it's so important, isn't it? We have an emotional connection to the NHS. And that is true of almost every person in this country. You know, in my case, uh, the NHS, I was born in the NHS, but it, it saved the lives of members of my family, several members of my family. Um, it, it, it's always that it's, it's there for you. Um, I also, I, I think that we as a party are increasingly seen as custodians of the NHS. We protected the NHS in its most difficult days during the peak of coronavirus in March and April. You know, we're here at Canary Wharf. We built those Nightingale hospitals and I, I'm really proud of how we've supported the NHS all the way through this. But, you know, that's the policy end. The truth is, when I go around the country meeting, uh, meeting people who work in the NHS, meeting the public, the thing that matters is that it is always there for you. And so many people have 
experienced some of either the best or the worst moments of their lives in the NHS. And, uh, and it's more than just a policy, it's an emotional relationship. It's an, well, no, I, and I completely agree. And just before um, COVID um, took hold, one of the key things that you were looking at was a women's strategy. And I do get a lot of flack for calling certain conservative ministers and MPs um, feminists, but I do believe that you are a feminist. So can you tell us about the health strategy and why it's so, like, you know, why you're so committed to make sure that the NHS does deliver for women? Well, I'm a, um, I'm a believer in e equal opportunities. And I think that if you believe in equality of opportunity, then you've got to believe in equality of opportunity, uh, no matter your gender. Uh, men and women uh, should have equal opportunities, in my view, and that makes me a feminist, I suppose. Uh, it, but it's rooted in a conservative value of equal opportunities and then trying to give people the best chance of making the most of their lives and, uh, and you know, at its heart, I believe so strongly that everybody has a contribution to make. Everybody has a, a part to play. And, you know, we've, we've talked about that during the pandemic because we've all got a part to play, but it's much broader than that. And, um, and, and, you know, one example of how we put that into reality is having a women's strategy, women's health strategy, um, because medicine for 200 years has been the domain of men. And there's, um, there's just not historically been the attention to some conditions that affect women more than they affect men. Take, um, uh, well, we, we talked about FGM, take, you know, the symptoms of a heart attack are still mm. taught as if they're the same for men and women and they're just different uh, for men and women. And um, uh, take conditions like endometriosis, you know, uh, enormously painful for, uh, for, for thousands of women and hasn't historically had the attention that it, that it deserves. So if we're going to be a party for everyone and we're going to level up, we've got to make sure that we're a party that, that, uh, that, that seeks out and promotes equality, between, equality of opportunity between men and women. So is that a commitment that the women's health strategy is going to be back on the table? Yes. So the women's health strategy, which we talked about immediately after the election, I was all guns blazing on it. Um, we've, uh, we, we'll obviously have to recast it post uh, COVID, but you know, building back better mm. means making sure that we get those 40 hospitals built that the prime minister announced on Friday night. And uh, that's a very exciting project. Uh, to get going. We hire the 50,000 nurses. We've now hired 14,100 more nurses in the last year and we're on track to our commitment of 50,000 that we made a lot of in the general election campaign and that we deliver our, our women's health strategy and this will be a big, uh, a big thing in the future. Okay, great. You know, I'm going to hold you to that. I'll be... I'm, I'm, quite, I'm getting used to being held to, uh, held okay. to the commitments I've made. Okay, that's great. Um, so, so another thing, so I know we've touched on COVID and it is the biggest um, thing that has happened in 2020. Can I just ask, first of all, how are you? How are you in, 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 in terms of dealing with this? And at the same time, like, you know, what, what has COVID taught you, not just as health secretary, but also as a member of the government? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, I, um, I think that um, I, I think the thing that it, it's taught me most is the importance of deciding what you need to do, deciding on the strategy, and then driving it through. If you think of, you know, the expansion of testing, there's a huge debate about testing. The expansion of testing wouldn't have happened without absolutely clear, strong direction that this is what we need to do. It's also taught me that we can do so many things so much faster. Yeah. You know, we, when we saw the stories from China of them building a hospital in a fortnight, people said, oh, we'll never be able to do that in Britain. And we did it in nine days with the Nightingale hospitals. And, you know, we can do this stuff. We can make it happen. And so I'm more convinced than ever in the, in the levelling up strategy that inspired so many people to vote Conservative in December, many for the first time, you know, levelling up and building back better. That is the agenda in health, in transport, in so many different areas, in the economy more broadly. That's the agenda that we need to, we need to follow. Of course, the next few months are going to be 
are going to be tough getting through coronavirus. Um, and then we've got to absolutely come out of that firing on all cylinders. And it's going to be hard. Um, but we know what we need to do. And I think that the, 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 the government's decision to not just stick by, but absolutely deliver on the key manifesto commitments, uh, like the yeah. 40 new hospitals uh, and, and others, uh, you know, Priti Patel hiring 20,000 more police, you know, we are going to deliver on these things, even though the, the challenges are so much greater than we could have ever envisaged back in December. Um, so I think one of the kind of things I pick up from your replies to those questions is that you're looking at more of a preventative um, measures within the NHS. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, the, this, is the, uh, this is one of the big things that we need to do to protect the NHS in the long term. So, uh, you know, the Conservative Party is without doubt the party of the NHS. We've, the first thing we did after the general election, the first law we passed was a law to put the uh, funding of the NHS uh, into law, onto the statute book. Um, we protected the NHS in its hour of most need during the peak of coronavirus. Um, and we're, we're going to deliver on those key commitments, 50,000 more nurses and 40 new hospitals. But we need to protect the NHS over the long term as well. And that means, yes, the people and yes, the buildings. But it also means enhancing, using the best modern technology and really embracing that. And it means a prevention of ill health. And I think for too long, the NHS has seen itself as providing just for, you know, picking up the pieces when things have gone wrong. And instead, we need more of a sense of uh, shared responsibility, individuals, people, everybody responsible for their own health, as well as the NHS taking responsibility to keep people healthy in the first place. And it's through more of a preventative agenda through the embrace of new technology, as well as the, the bricks and mortar, and obviously the people who, are, yeah. who make up the NHS. That's how we protect the NHS in the future. And I'm absolutely determined that we will always be the party of the NHS. Well, that's really great to hear, because I think one of the um, key elements is that as, as somebody that works on something like female genital mutilation, I have been talking to countries with, to really look at the fact that the well-being, the healthy, the health of a country is actually very much key to its economic growth. Yes. And that's one of the key things. So for us um, at the Five Foundation, we've looked at economic development yeah. and things like violence against women and girls. So I think that's a, would you agree on the fact well, that a healthy um, population is, leads to a wealthier population? Well, we've, we've seen that during the pandemic. You know, we know that you're more likely to die from coronavirus if you're obese. I can't think of a better reason to tackle obesity, yeah. and let's not doing it not do it through uh, nannying. We do it through supporting people. So, for instance, I want to change the system so that when you go to your GP, you know, if you're overweight, they help you and help you to get to to deal with it in the same way that they now do that for people who uh, who smoke. And that it's support like that to help people stay. Uh, stay healthy and harnessing technology like the brilliant um, NHS COVID app, which now yeah. had over 15 million downloads. It's been an absolute, uh, it's gone off the shelves like, like hotcakes, like digital hotcakes. And, um, uh, and, and so combine the use of technology with the ability to help to keep people healthy in the first place. That once we're through this pandemic and this too will pass, we will then and that's, we will then be able to build the future of the NHS based on, based on these principles that we've learned. Now, honestly, I think one of the exciting things about having you as health secretary is, is, is the fact that you're not just committed to women's health, but also you're committed to technology and using the 21st century skills that we have in order to improve our NHS. I know a lot of people can be skeptical about that, but can you just tell us the power of yeah. technology within health? Well, I think that people have, have seen during the pandemic that, you know, if you want to visit your doctor, it's really important that you should be able to have a face-to-face. -face. Mm. Um, but for many, many people, talking to them on the phone or on video conference is more convenient and easier. Now, obviously, there are health 
complications you might have where you need to physically meet people, of course. Yeah. Uh, um, but having the option is the best of both worlds. And now about 50% of visits to the GP and about 50% of outpatient visits are done by telemedicine. That's up from under 10% before the, uh, before the crisis. It's good for patients. It's good for doctors. It's these sorts of things that are going to mean that we can protect the NHS and that it's not only uh, uh, you know, the right thing to do, but also it's, a, it's the best and most effective, most efficient way of providing healthcare um, because you can embrace that technology and it's, uh, so you get the better value for money, which is an important conservative principle we should never lose sight of. Well, on that note, I'm going to embrace technology myself and see um, some of the questions that are coming in. Um, so if you do have any questions for the health secretary, please do send them through. So um, one of the ones that I have here is um, being a nurse is, is one of the most rewarding careers. How are you going to try to encourage more people to come into the profession? Well, th there's, a, uh, there's, a, I, there's a massive programme now of hiring more nurses. We made that commitment, 50,000 more nurses. Um, we were, at, we were, uh, we were, you know, putting that in train when the pandemic struck. We then opened up the recruitment of nurses to more people during the pandemic because we needed the uh, extra staff, and that's led to a, a, a big increase, including some retired nurses coming back to the profession. You know, my grandmother was a nurse, and uh, I grew up understanding from her just how fulfilling it is to spend your days caring for others and. Uh, and making them better and looking after them. And so we've got to make the NHS a more uh, fulfilling place to work. We've got to make sure that it's um, at all levels open to new ideas and people who want to improve it get the encouragement to do that. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and we're going to, we're going to hire more nurses and we're going to keep doing that until we, uh, until we have what we need in the NHS. Great. Um, well, you're not just the health secretary for the NHS, um, but you're also um, the care um, secretary as well. So one of the questions here is, what is the government, um, what is the government's plans to make the UK more dementia friendly? Yeah. And how are you supporting people and families living with dementia? Yeah. Well, this is another critical area uh, and another area where we have made commitments in our manifesto that we must meet. Um, the uh, on dementia we committed to doubling the research funding for dementia, and we've done that. And I hope that that will bring, bear, uh, will bring fruits uh, in, the, in the years to come. Um, there is just the chance that we can find medicine and a breakthrough that means that we can delay the onset of dementia or potentially even stop it altogether. And my, the same grandmother I was talking about who was a, who was a nurse, mm. she lived with dementia for the last five or so years of her life. And fortunately, she stayed um, cheerful and, uh, uh, and her, kept her uh, dry wit uh, right through. But it was, it was painful to see her decline. And that's a, that... that Commitment in our manifesto is a commitment that we will deliver on uh, to, to, to do everything we can to find new breakthroughs. And I want to use, I want to use Brexit to mean that we can have um, the best, most dynamic health regulator in the world that can, uh, that can bring technologies to bear as fast as is safely possible. Uh, I want us to be working with people from right around the world uh, not just as we are now on, on coronavirus treatments, where we've come up with, the, we're the only country that's come up with a treatment that is known to work, uh, but on treatments for all sorts of other illnesses as well. Is that another place where technology can actually play a key role in terms of helping us to be innovative? And Yes, it's, it's, it's critical. And the way that we do healthcare is completely changing because of, because of technology. And we've got to embrace that. Uh, and we've got to embrace it, and then we've got to explain to the public why it matters. Yeah. It matters because it saves lives. It matters because it might be able to delay the onset of dementia. It matters because uh, it means that everybody in this country can live with the confidence that if they fall ill, then we will all come together to look after them. It's ultimately the NHS is a patriotic institution, and uh, it, I think it's a... A, 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 a deeply conservative principle to believe in patriotism and equal opportunities and that's what we as a party unashamedly need to get out and shout from the rooftops 
I think what was interesting is that we saw the NHS as kind of like a family member at the time of the crisis, yeah. um, which that's something that my mum said. But one of the questions um, coming back to COVID is, so what, what are your hopes for um, a COVID vaccine being developed? Well, this is the, this is the great hope, isn't it? And um, the Prime Minister said this morning there'll be uh, some bumpy months ahead, but we're working as hard as we can to get a vaccine as fast as safely possible. Um, and um, there are, the plans are in train. A combination of the NHS and the armed forces are involved in the logistics of making this happen, making the rollout happen, because it's not just about developing the vaccine yeah. uh, it, and then testing the vaccine, which is what's happening now. It's then a matter of rolling out the vaccine according to priority, according to clinical need. We've set out the order in which people will, will get it. Uh, and um, we've set that out in draft, pending the final clinical data. And uh, no, you know, no vaccine certain, the technology is certain, and um, we've got to make sure that we, uh, we, this is done safely. And you know, you'll have seen that we paused it um, to check on the safety. We absolutely will not, um, will not shirk from our responsibilities in terms of its safety. But that will then help us to start getting out of this so that I hope that by, um, you know, by, by next year, you know, the rest of this parliament is then about the recovery of this country. And having come into politics inspired by um, what we can do to support small businesses, I come from a small business background, you know, getting back onto the, on, uh, getting the, back onto the agenda of of, 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 of leveling up and of the economic recovery uh, that we are going to need. Um, that I, I'm desperate for us to get, to, to defeat this virus and then get this country back firing on all cylinders again. I, kind of, well, I do believe that we will defeat this virus, but I think your positive um, kind of energy with that um, really does help. What um, I, I, I do think um, that we will beat the virus, but what are your kind of final thoughts as we um, sit here today on a Sunday in 2020? What do you think 2021 is going to look like for the NHS and for this country? Well, I think the, the story of 2021 uh, is a long way off already. I mean, uh, three months is a long time in the life of a health secretary in the middle of a pandemic. But um, we, we, you know, I hope, I hope we can have as normal a Christmas as possible. I then hope uh, that the vaccine technologies work and I then hope we can get back onto the business of, uh, 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 of recovery. And that's what I want to see. Uh, and, uh, and I think we should all be energized and doing the work now, like the 40 hospitals announcement, so that despite the fact that we have this extraordinarily difficult and challenging thing that has been thrown at us, this pandemic, uh, that we can steer the country as well and as safely as possible through these incredibly stormy waters and then, and then sail into calmer seas beyond. Well, I'm really hopeful of that as well. Um, thank you very much, Secretary of State, for your time and thank you for having me as, as your interviewer, as it were. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and good afternoon.